Do not throw me to the English wolves, now howling for my destruction. So began a manifesto to the Irish people, which Parnell wrote in 1891. He talked about how the independence and integrity of a section of the Irish party had been sapped and destroyed by wire pulling of the English Liberal Party. But unfortunately for him, this split in Ireland was impossible to heal. He gave a speech in Dublin at the Mansion House in which he spoke about how he would like to be able to walk like Moses in the promised land. He said, I am almost within sight of that promised land and please God, I will someday enter it with you. But like Moses, he was never to see that day. James Joyce, later, who was a huge admirer of Parnell, later said that at this time, Parnell seemed to be strong to the verge of weakness. He was strong enough to keep going, to continue with the fight, but unable to win it. And in those three by-elections in 1891, the pro-Parnell candidate lost in every single one. And Parnell began to shrivel. The trauma, the pain of this whole thing began to eat away at him. A friend, a newspaper a journalist, uh, wrote at this time, Mr. Parnell's face was thinner than ever I had seen it. The luster of his eyes was gone. They seemed tired and dazed. He smoked or rather half smoked numbers of cigarettes, throwing one away after another. His gesticulations, his familiarities with followers were utterly different from anything I had seen in his demeanor before. The uncrowned king is breaking down. On the 25th of June, 1891, two days before his 45th birthday, Parnell married Catherine O'Shea. He married her in a registry office in Brighton. And even that caused further controversy. It was seen as having compounded the offence by now marrying the divorced woman, the woman that you were committing adultery with. It was an aggravation of his moral offence. The nation the newspaper that had been founded by the Young Irelanders, this organ of Nationalist Ireland, denounced him for getting married. It quoted from the book of Ma the Gospel of Matthew, saying that he that shall marry her that is put away committeth adultery. And so you had Catholic Ireland turning against, oh, turning against Parnell, denouncing Parnell. And the bitterness was extraordinary. Arthur Griffith, the future leader of Sinn Féin, was 20 years old when he saw Parnell speak at one of these meetings and he said that he saw him looking wretchedly ill and returning to Brighton to be beside his beloved wife, Parnell died on the 6th of October 1891, having always said that he felt that something bad would happen to him in the month of October. Winston Churchill was someone who admired Parnell greatly and he said that he was a being who seemed to exercise unconsciously an indefinable sense of power in repose, of command awaiting the hour, a line which equally could apply to Winston Churchill himself. Uh, one of his MPs, James O'Kelly, said that under his rule, under Parnell's rule, Ireland became a nation. However, he left a legacy of bitterness and a legacy of division. It's also not entirely clear what, is, what he really thought on some of the more radical issues of the day. Joseph Bigger uh, famously once said, I wonder what Mr. Parnell's politics really are. In other words, how much will he really go down the line of physical force? How much will he really go to support the land agitators? Uh, he died. And the party took a decade to recover and eventually reunited under John Redmond with Dylan, the leader of the anti-Parnellites, uh, becoming the deputy leader. And they would continue to rule the parliamentary party up until its virtual annihilation in 1918. When Redmond was dead, Dylan was the leader and Dylan was to lose his seat. Uh, FSL Lines, the great Trinity historian, uh, later wrote a book about Parnell. He actually wrote it while he was Provost of Trinity, when he was President of Trinity. And in it he said that the great failure of, of Parnell was that he hadn't really understood that there were two nations in Ireland, that there was a unionist community and a nationalist community, and that that was a major weakness. 
But other historians have suggested that maybe towards the end of his life, he was beginning to recognise that. For example, he gave a speech in Belfast a few months before his death, where he said that it is undoubtedly true that until the prejudices of the Protestant and Unionist minority are conciliated, Ireland can never enjoy perfect freedom. Ireland can never be united. So it's possible that towards the end, he had begun to recognise that before Home Rule could be successful, before an Irish Parliament could be achieved, they would have to address the problem of Ulster. And the problem of Ulster was something that was to be devil Irish politics for decades afterwards, because it was very hard for the nationalists to really understand Ulster. They preferred to see this as a conflict between Ireland and Britain, the Irish and the British. And they liked to believe that once you got the British out of Ireland, then North and South could be united, Unionist and Nationalist, Catholic and Protestant, because they didn't want to acknowledge, even to themselves, that there could be a divide in the country. Even de Valera, Eamon de Valera, when he was fundraising uh, for the Irish Republic in America in 1917, gave speeches where he said, you know, if the British leave, we believe that the Unionists will want to join us, and if they don't, we'll respect that because they had convinced themselves that that was really the major obstacle. This foreign power had, had corrupted uh, the Unionists, uh, who were mainly in Ulster and elsewhere in the country. So the death of Parnell also created the idea of the lost leader. And that was also to be a prevalent theme in Irish history, especially during the revolutionary period. The death of Collins, Michael Collins in, in 1922. The death of the 1916 leaders. The death of Parnell at the age of 45. What might have happened if the party had stayed behind them? What might have happened if the bishops had stayed out of Irish politics? James Joyce loved Parnell. He was one of his great heroes. And he wrote an essay on the shade of Parnell in 1912, which ended with the lines, In his final desperate appeal to his countrymen, he begged them not to throw him as a sop to the English wolves howling around them. It redounds to their credit that they did not fail this appeal. They did not throw him to the English wolves. They tore him to pieces themselves. For the 50th anniversary of the death of Parnell, Eamon de Valera was the Prime Minister, the Taoiseach of Ireland, and he went to Glasnevin Cemetery, where Parnell is buried, to lay a wreath there. And they put the tricolour over the stone which Parnell had himself chosen. This was how he wanted to be buried. But in his oration, de Valera said that the willingness that were it not for the fearless and practical leadership of Parnell and the willingness of the generation which he led to face heart-rending privations and untold sufferings, the farmers of Ireland, now lords of their own fields, would still be serfs. That was seen as his lasting legacy, the way he had resolved the land problems of Ireland. But he had also done much more. He had shown how a Home Rule Bill could be brought before the House of Commons, and he had created an inspiration to the future. In his semi-autobiographical novel, Portrait of the Artist of a Young Man, James Joyce returns to the theme of the fall of Parnell. He talks about how, uh, he, talks about how uh, he was for Ireland, and so was his father. He begins by talking about how uh, this was a story about how they had a portrait of Parnell on it and his aunt was furious with it, his aunt who he called Dante. And he talks about how in the start of the novel, Dante had ripped the green velvet back off the brush that was for Parnell. She ripped it off one day with her scissors and had told him that Parnell was a bad man. He wondered if they were arguing about this at home. That was called politics. And later on, a little bit further in the novel, they're having a Christmas dinner. And of course, they are discussing politics and they are discussing Parnell. And I think what this also shows is the Parnell split was something that divided houses in Ireland. Families were torn. Were you for Parnell or were you against him? Was he an adulterer or did his private life not matter at all? Were the bishops right or were they wrong? 
Let him remember too, cried Mr. Casey to her from across the table. The language with which the priests and the priest pawns broke Parnell's heart and hounded him into his grave. Let him remember that too when he grows up. And later, uh, Stephen Dedalus, uh, the, the, the Joyce's character in the novel said, he was for Parnell and Ireland and so was his father. And so was Dante too. For one night at the band on the Esplanade, she had hit a gentleman on the head with her umbrella because he had taken off his hat when the band played God Save the Queen at the end. Mr. Dedalus gave a snort of contempt. Ah, John, he said, it is true for them. We are an unfortunate priest-ridden race and always were and always will be till the end of this chapter. Uncle Charles shook his head saying, a bad business, a bad business. Mr. Dedalus repeated, a priest-ridden, God-forsaken race. A traitor to his country, replied Dante, a traitor, an adulterer. The priests were right to abandon him. The priests were always the true friends of Ireland. Were they faith? said Mr. Casey. He threw his fist on the table and frowning angrily, protruded one finger after another. Didn't the bishops of Ireland betray us at the time of the union when Bishop Lanigan presented an address of loyalty to the Marquis Cornwallis? Didn't the bishops and priests sell the aspirations of their country in 1829 in return for Catholic emancipation? Didn't they denounce the Fenian movement from the pulpit and in the confession box? His face was glowing with anger and Stephen felt the glow rise in his own cheek as the spoken words thrilled him. Mr. Dedalus uttered a guffaw of coarse scorn. And at the end, Dante shoved her chair violently aside and left the table, upsetting her napkin ring, which rolled slowly along the carpet and came to rest against the foot of an easy chair. Mrs. Dedalus rose quickly and followed her towards the door. At the door, Dante turned round violently and shouted down the room, her cheeks flushed and quivering with rage. Devil out of hell, we won. We crushed him to death, fiend. The door slammed behind her. Mr. Casey, freeing his arms from his holders, suddenly bowed his head on his hands with a sob of pain. Poor Parnell, he cried loudly, my dead king. He sobbed loudly and bitterly. Stephen, raising his terror-stricken face, saw that his father's eyes were full of tears.